Houston. My name is Ann Skeet, and I'm the Senior Director of Leadership Ethics at the Markle Center for Applied Ethics, and it's great to have you all here today. Um, before I share a little bit uh, more about Kirk and introduce the two students who will be interviewing him today, I want to thank the people who've been instrumental in putting together today's program. My colleagues Joel Dibble and Debbie Dimbecki in the Center's Marketing and Communications area, and the talented group of student marketing interns that they work with, as well as Megan Chauvin and Monica DeLong. I also want to let you know that today's session is being recorded and all event registrants will receive an email with a link to the event replay. It will also be available on the Center's YouTube channel. And if you have any questions as today's uh, program unfolds, feel free to put them in the Q&A and I'll be doing my best to kind of group them up at the end of our conversation so that Isabella and Jonathan um, can um, field your questions and pose them to Kirk. Um, Isabella Draskovich is originally from the Los Angeles area. She's a recent graduate from Santa Clara University's Levy School of Business, where she re received a degree in management. During her time at Santa Clara, she was involved with the Student Alumni Council Career Center and was a peer career advisor for the business school. Even though she's officially done with school, she's excited to be here today to discuss the future of ethics and business. Jonathan Sampson is a rising junior from Fremont, California. He's pursuing an economics major with a concentration in data analytics and a French and Francophone studies minor. He is a member of AudioSync, one of Santa Clara's acapella groups, a DJ for the university's radio station, and is excited to discuss what the future of ethical business might look like as well. Our guest today, Kirk Hansen, recently stepped down as the University Professor and Executive Director of the Markle Center for Applied Ethics after 17 years at its helm. He earlier taught for 23 years at Stanford Business School and is considered one of the pioneers in the study and practice of business ethics. He's currently a senior fellow at the center and continues to write on managing the ethical and public behavior of corporations and their leaders. He um, co-edited a four volume series released in 2006 entitled The Accountable Corporation. And he was the founding president of the Business Enterprise Trust, a national organization created by leaders in business, labor, media and academia to promote exemplary behavior in business organizations. He was the first chairman of the Santa Clara County Political Ethics Commission and currently serves on the board for the Compassion Institute and the advisory board of the Neely Center for Ethical Leadership at USC. He's also just concluded 18 years of service on the board of the Skoll Community Fund. Kirk is a graduate of Stanford University and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He also held graduate fellowships and research appointments at Yale Divinity School and the Harvard Business School and holds two honorary doctorate degrees. He was honored by the Aspen Institute Center for Business Education with a lifetime achievement for contributions to business and society. You've been busy, Kirk. You, you deserve this. <laughs> you deserve a break from this, uh, from, from running centers like this. Um, so I am now uh, gonna turn it over to Isabella who's gonna get us started with our first question. Welcome, it's great to have you back at the center, Kirk. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne, and super excited to be here with Kirk. Uh, I guess the first question I had, um, first of all, had a great time reading your book. So first question is just what sparked um, your desire to write this book? Well, this was my first uh, post-retirement project uh, was to write what frankly is an edgy book uh, entitled Rotten, uh, Why Corporate Misconduct Continues. And I, I think there were a couple of reasons that I wanted to do this uh, first. Uh, first of all, it's not just about bad behavior. It's all of my thoughts about how we can improve corporate behavior. So it isn't all as dark as perhaps the title, which uh, my editor and my wife recommended. Uh, and uh, with that duo, I chose the rotten title. Um, but I think it was first uh, that this is the mission of the Markola Center and the mission of my own career is to try to improve corporate behavior. And that yet there's a frustration about how much misbehavior continues. And by some counts, you could even say corporate misbehavior has gotten worse in recent years. Um, it's hard to make that case. And so in, a, in any case, 
uh, corporate misconduct has continued unabated. And I wanted to explore why that was true. Uh, so it's a little bit out of frustration. The, the other thing is that it is a, a project uh, of retirement, as Anne suggested. And uh, after 50 years working on corporate behavior, working for companies, working in nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, teaching at Stanford for many, many years, retiring from there and coming to Santa Clara for a wonderful experience the last 20 years, um, I felt I had a unique perspective on why this misconduct continues. And so there was a sense that I ought to offer those thoughts and they could be either validated or shot down by the many uh, uh, observers of the corporate scene. So it's both frustration and a sense of obligation. So to write a book like this, you need to have a lot of experience in the field. So what have you learned during your extensive 50 years of experience working to embolden ethical business? Well, I think if, if you focus on the core message in this book, it is that ethics can't be a bolt on or add on or additional duty that managing an ethical organization absolutely demands that that be placed at the center of the nature of the institution, the, the purpose of the corporation, and at the center of the management uh, task uh, that the senior executives take on. Um, I, I think too often ethics has been an add-on and uh, ethics, oh, that's the problem of the compliance officer. The ethics, that's, that's something we, we handle by giving an annual talk or having an annual training uh, exercise. Um, I th I've come to believe only a strong corporate, social, as well as economic purpose will suffice. And that in the absence of that, we're gonna continue to see the levels of misconduct that we've had uh, over the last uh, 10 and 50 years. So uh, I hope desperately that corporations take this more seriously than they ever have in the past. And that's the nature of the recommendations in the book, which is how to take it more seriously. Um, there, there's a sense in which most corporations, if you said, do you take ethics seriously? will say, of course we do. Of course we do. And we're doing all of those things you might recommend. Uh, but the point is that they've got to be done at a totally different level. And there are some new things that need to be done as well. Um, and kind of going off of that, what would you say for like, from what I know of, most established companies do have a compliance office, but what would you say is the difference between ethics and compliance? Well, it's interesting. The term compliance only entered the field uh, really starting in the 90s. Prior to that time, this general field was known as business ethics or uh, ethical behavior in the corporation. Uh, but what happened in 1991 was that the uh, US sentencing guidelines were adopted and lawyers came to dominate corporate efforts to manage ethics. And so uh, it's represented in my mind in a very um, uh, symbolic way by the fact that the Ethics Officers Association, which was a corporate professional society of those executives who were charged with managing ethics, changed its name to the Ethics and Compliance Officers Association. And the membership shifted from being not dominated by lawyers to being almost exclusively lawyers. And so the idea was that there are a set of bright lines that we need to defend. Uh, there are a set of, of absolutes and we simply need to get everybody to follow that set of absolutes and then we're ethical. Ethics asks a different question. Ethics says, how should we be acting? Not what are the minimums that we ought to be doing? And so ethics asks, what do we owe to our employees? In general, what do we owe to our employees? What do we owe to our business partners, our co-investors, our uh, uh, shareholders, our uh, business partners that are in our supply chain? Um, and asks the ethics question as opposed to the compliance question. It's how should we behave towards these people rather than what are the laws, the minimum standards that we ought to adhere to? So 
talking more about the things that companies can do to embolden the, uh, both compliance and ethics in their businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, within the book, you discuss nine strategies that businesses use to control uh, corporate misconduct. Mm -hmm. My question to you would be, which of the nine do you believe to be the most important or has the most promise to function in the future? And going off of that, which do you think has done the least in the past to curb fraud? Yeah. Well, uh, in the book, we identify with it, we have two core uh, uh, lists or uh, important uh, exhibits. One is what have we tried in the past to control corporate misconduct, and then we have another, and there are nine things on that, and then there are ten things one ought to do now, uh, and uh, so those are the those are the core that organize the book. There are also quite a number of interesting new uh, tools that we develop uh, towards the end of the book, which Mark Epstein, my co-author, who's an accounting professor with a uh, extensive background in systems design and management that we recommend to evaluate ethics risk, to manage ethics risk and so on. But um, just looking at what we've done in the past, the, the first strategy that most companies tried to follow was we rely on the integrity of our employees. Uh, and um, uh, we hire only good people. And that proved itself to be an in inadequate answer pretty quickly. Uh, there are bad people in the world and there are people who are weak in their uh, integrity and their ethical backbone and their willingness to resist pressures that they might face in the company or when they go out and compete uh, in the world. And so organizations um, uh, which relied primarily on that uh, uh, had really terrible scandals and, and failures. Um, I think ethics programs became the, the, if you like, one size fits all answer. Uh, and ethics programs tended to be built around a code of conduct and an annual training and a whistleblowing system. Those were the most discussed and key elements. But the problem, of course, um, is that there's, there have been deep flaws in each of those as practiced by many companies, if not most companies. The codes of conduct were compliance oriented rather than inspirational and ethics oriented. The trainings were compliance oriented. We want you to obey this set of absolute rules uh, and now sign this document that says, you know, that's what is expected of you. And then the whistleblowing system, um, which unfortunately has been in many companies like a sieve, uh, instead of uh, indeed being a confidential uh, protected avenue to raise issues, um, there's been extensive retaliation in many organizations. And so there's been little trust in many corporations in uh, the uh, hotline or ethics line or uh, whistleblowing line that was um, uh, established. Uh, there have been improvements in, in each of those, but I think there are still major flaws, and that's the case we make in the book. Um, I hope the book's read by compliance officers because we, we try to address what those weaknesses are and uh, what can be done about them uh, today. So th th those would be the things that have been done most in the past. Uh, and as I mentioned to, to uh, Isabella earlier, the, the core idea that uh, drives our prescriptions in the book is that only the definition of a social purpose as well as an economic purpose can drive a different approach to ethics and can give one the chance to restrain um, the kind of misconduct which has occurred. Um, the, um, uh, the other, let me mention one other thing in answer to your question of what did we learn in these past experiences. Uh, we build the book around uh, the metaphor of bad apple, bad barrel, and bad orchard. I think bad barrel and bad apple have been mentioned before, but we claim to have created the bad orchard concept. Uh, whether we have or not, I'm not entirely sure. But it's, it's the core of the book. It's the analysis of why misconduct continues. It continues because there are some bad people, that's bad apples. And I guess my belief after working with companies all these years is 
inevitably um, there are bad people in every organization, no matter how well you screen uh, at, the, uh, at the hiring level. Um, and secondly, bad barrel, there are bad corporate cultures and corporate cultures um, uh, fade over time. Uh, such that you might have at moments in time a fairly strong ethical culture, but without a renewal and without an incredible amount of emphasis, it, uh, it fades. Uh, and then the bad orchard concept is one that I don't think companies have paid enough attention to, which is that there are some really bad competitive environments. It could be China where they're being pressured uh, to uh, engage in oppression of the Uyghur uh, minority. It could be um, uh, competitive environments where uh, corruption is, is rife, maybe particular countries or even particular industries. Virtually every aircraft manufacturer in the last 10 years has had a major bribery scandal because with just two to four bidders for any contract, the pressure to find ways of incenting that purchasing officer to favor your company are just so great. So that's an example of a bad orchard. So we, we, we think companies haven't attended enough to each of those causes and that that will result in a different kind of ethics commitment and a different kind of ethics uh, uh, program. So Kirk, you're bringing up an interesting point about industries where there's only a few players um, and, mm -hmm. and that are really dominated by just, you know, a monopoly or oligopoly situation. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, you know, how you guys, how you think about that? Well, first of all, all of these things we talk about are what I would call ethics risks. And so the key to having a, an ethical corporation or avoiding misconduct is the management of that risk. Um, many sales organizations, just to use an example that's not uh, uh, oligopoly, but uh, many sales organizations realize that their salespeople out in the field are far from headquarters and may engage in things even to divvy up the business with uh, the competitor's salespeople. And so uh, the, the company will put a tremendous amount of effort into managing that specific ethics risk. Similarly, if you're in, if you're Boeing or you're Airbus or you're Embraer uh, today, you need to understand that every bidding process is going to be really risky in terms of the temptations to find some way of, of bribing or incenting uh, that uh, individual who's making the choice of an aircraft, which is a 50 to $100 million purchase, uh, a lot's at stake. And if uh, uh, giving that person a small bribe will tip the scales, the temptation is going to be great. So you need, you need more control measures, you need systems for control, you need watchfulness, you need uh, a lot more risk management than you do in some other industries that don't have that same character. And going off of that, um kind of similar thought. Um, what do you think is the most effective tool you've seen companies use now or in the past to help promote and maintain an ethical culture within their company and one that employees will truly embrace on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. I think the, the the hurdle that companies have got to, to uh, mount is that once they can create a genuine corporate social purpose as well as economic purpose, the game changes. And so if you define, let's say you're a pharmaceutical firm and you say, yes, we're trying to make money, but we really are trying to alleviate human suffering. This uh, during uh, a number of phases of Merck's history or Johnson and Johnson's history, they've gotten the balance right, uh, that they had both the social purpose and the economic purpose. At other times they didn't get it right. But once you've, you've gotten that balance between the two, then you ask different questions about every strategic decision and every tactical choice within the organization. Uh, you don't just ask the question, how can we increase sales? You know, the worst example being 
of, of the Sackler family and opioids, which is now so much in the news. If the only thing you wanted to do was increase sales, you get some absurd, unethical kinds of suggestions, uh, which uh, the Sackler family got from many of their consultants. Um, if, uh, but if you've defined a social purpose as well as an economic purpose, and then you begin to adopt strategic initiatives that match that, you start to find ways to serve underserved populations. You find ways to do some kind of manufacturing with an eye to climate uh, that hadn't been discovered before or uh, that you could improve on. If you find ways to use your supply chain in ways to help people that haven't been helped before. That creates stories and infects, if you like, the whole organization to encourage people to think about uh, social purpose at the same time as economic. And when those two things are in competition, uh, you get uh, decisions that are favoring the social purpose. Um, you know, the people at Wells Fargo, which is one of the cases we discuss at length in the book, who set up this sales system, which said you were compensated on the basis of number of new accounts opened. And it didn't matter whether the accounts were closed five minutes later. Uh, uh, and um, uh, it incented people because that, that was the sole focus to simply open up whatever accounts they could. And so you had in the end, millions of fake accounts being created in order that those salespeople could get their bonuses. Um, so you begin to adopt incentive systems and strategies that serve the social as well as the economic purpose. And that changes the game completely. And uh, the one other thing I would point to that, that we've come to believe, Mark and I very strongly, is that you've got to give that responsibility for ethics to the line organization rather than to the ethics officer. You've got to have the, the heads of your divisions each responsible for that balance of the social and the economic objectives of the organization. If any of them feel that ethics is the responsibility of somebody else, you've lost the game. So I'll just say that making it a line responsibility is the other thing we emphasize a lot. Yeah, and this is similar to what you were just discussing, but for large co companies, the ones that have 20,000 plus employees, obviously they need to have those structured compliance programs in place. So what do you suggest that these larger type companies can do to transition from being more of a checklist type of compliance mm -hmm. program where it's like, okay, once a year, we're having employees fill out the survey, we're checking in once a year. How do you suggest that they make that transition? Well, the, the symbol in many organizations to the fact that it, ethics is not taken seriously is the CEO letter, which may uh, introduce the annual, some kind of annual report or the uh, annual ethics training. Instead, you need a genuine CEO message, which um, talks about the social as well as the economic purpose which uh, emphasizes the commitment the organization has in every one of its decisions, which um, talks about the management of ethics risk and says that we know there uh, are gonna be temptations in the organization. So the first thing is, is the tone at the top, uh, which is created, which is a very different tone at the top than you see in the vast majority of, of companies. Um, uh, the second is uh, uh, we, we recommend a number of changes, specific changes in ethics programs. The training has to be centered around what are the ethical dilemmas that are most commonly encountered in this particular division. If you're in the sales force, we can talk about the pressures that salespeople face. If you're in finance, we can talk about the temptation to fudge the numbers. Um, if you're in the research organization, we can talk about how uh, there's this competition to take advantage of, to, to be the one responsible for an innovation, or even to violate the intellectual property, perhaps, of a competitor. 
Those are unavoidable and predictable kinds of dilemmas. And you got to talk about those explicitly in your training if you're going to have the people in all these different parts of the organization and in the far-flung parts of the world to understand that this ethics message is meant for them. Um, so th those, are, those are amongst the key things. Uh, I, I suppose I'd also focus on the ethics um, risk calculation. Uh, we spend a chapter in the book talking about how to evaluate ethics risk and giving some instruments uh, to do that. And um, every organization faces ethics risk and unless it takes it seriously, does a good job of evaluating it um, and then letting that drive the ethics training and let that drive the creation of new incentives, you're just not gonna make progress um, against those ethics risks. Just to give you an example, I, I was working with one organization as a consultant on ethics and I suddenly heard they had decided to buy a number of organizations in China, a number of companies in China. And I asked, well, what provisions have you put in uh, to monitor the behavior and the, the um, ethical cultures within those organizations? Oh yeah, we're gonna have to get around to that. I think we're gonna, that's next quarter's objective or two quarters out. And that just is not adequate to manage the ethics risk. Um, so, uh, the, the, you know, those are, the concept of ethics risk is really important, but it has to be taken much more seriously than companies have in the past. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I like what you mentioned about having it specific to department rather than just like having this like company wide, like, okay, once a year, we're going to do this, but really making it specific based on wherever you are within the company, what mm -hmm. um, risks could potentially be there. No, I, I think that's true. I, I think, again, the one size fits all. A lot of companies mm -hmm. have one code of conduct and one message in training that isn't really tailored to the, the real, the, the lived reality, to use that term, or the real experiences of employees in that operation. The most they will sometimes do is they'll say, oh, well, this employee could run afoul of these eight uh, laws or regulations. So we'll train them very specifically on the compliance obligations having to do with those specific uh, laws or regulations. That's not tailoring. That's, that's again, at the bare minimum behavior. Got to talk about uh, aspirational behavior, purpose-related behavior, uh, and uh, what kind of dilemmas you're going to face in order to achieve uh, more consistent good behavior. So Kirk, I know Jonathan has a question to ask you next, but just listening to this exchange with Isabella uh, reminds me that I've neglected to mention that Jonathan and Isabella are uh, both alumni or current participants in our business ethics internship program. And so when Isabella is sort of asking a question or affirming some of what she's hearing from you, it's come from the perspective of our students who get to work in ethics and compliance organizations right here in Silicon Valley. So. Um, After so I, just, I have the, I, I take credit for hiring Anne uh, at the Markola <laughs> Center. And after she came, we, we had had a little experiment with like, what, one or two people in companies. And the next thing I knew, we had a whole program of business uh, ethics interns. And that's all to uh, Anne's credit. So I'm delighted. It's continuing delighted that Isabella and Jonathan have had the chance this last year to do that. So uh, I'm also glad that Anne is here because I wouldn't be here without Anne. So, <laughs> um, so you were speaking about tailoring ethics for specific parts of a company and not having a one size fits all kind of yeah. mold. Are there any incentive systems that you think companies should do away with to encourage more ethical culture and behavior from employees? Oh boy, incentive systems. This, this is one of the most difficult things in corporate management is getting the balance between pushing people hard and not pushing them so hard that they're, they conclude, oh, he or she, the boss, really wants me to cut the ethical corners in order to make that sale or to get this uh, shipped on time or whatever. Uh, and so the, the, con the construction of incentive systems that 
strikes that balance is, is the challenge. We can talk about the terrible examples. Um, Wells Fargo is one of the worst that, that not only did employees have to open new accounts, but we never checked to see whether the accounts were open more than five minutes, but um, uh, they uh, were given goals that were not goals for the month, not even goals for the week, not even goals for the day. Wells Fargo got down to the point where an employee had a goal of certain number of new accounts being opened within an hour. And when you're running out at the 58th moment, you realize you're about to lose uh, whatever credits you've gotten towards a bonus and you start to manufacture things. And that was inevitable. There's a sense in which if anyone had looked at that incentive system, it was inevitable. One of the cases, I'll just refer to a classic case that demonstrates this, and that's a case of H.J. Heinz, um, a company uh, ketchup and a number of other things, but Heinz had a compensation system that uh, uh, was such a bad example that it got written up in a great case that I taught for years at Santa Clara and Stanford. Um, and what it did was it said, you got no bonus. In fact, nobody in your division got a bonus unless the entire division raised its sales each year by an amount that was usually between 10 and 15%. So it said, no matter what external conditions you faced, you were toast. You, you lost a substantial part of your income if you didn't hit 15%. So you got a lot of, of uh, tawdry behavior as people tried to demonstrate that these were actual sales or uh, you had a lot of side letters written, un, un, uh, not permitted side letters. Maybe you'd buy back the product next year that you uh, sold this year. Uh, and then they, they compounded this problem by saying, uh, if you hit a 25% growth rate, you got basically 3x bonus, huge reward. So you had over time the incentive that if you were, say you had, you had your growth was pretty good that year of 20%, would you claim it was 20% and just get 1x bonus? Or would you try to bank 5% of it and use it for the next year? So they had all kinds of accounting irregularities in which managers were banking their earnings and trying to recognize them the following year when they could get 25% and get a giant bonus. Uh, and this system spread throughout Heinz based on the structure of the compensation system. And it's, a, it's an object lesson. It's still taught in business schools today, um, that uh, a case of a poorly designed compensation system that incented unethical behavior. So, uh, so the task, you know, coming back to it, it's going to depend on each individual thing you're trying to incent and control, uh, but it's going to got to be done with the view of saying, what, how can this be gamed? How can somebody game this and falsify it? And am I giving the right incentives, the right balance that I uh, want to do? Uh, one of the things we recommend in the book is every company take a look immediately at all of their incentive systems and, and ask those questions of uh, what's the balance of incentives uh, and how can this be gamed? And then set in process that every newly proposed incentive system or compensation system uh, gets asked the same questions. Um, and we actually have a question from the audience um, and they, want to get your perspective of within companies, do you think ethics and compliance should be uncoupled? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having them continue to be managed in the same way. I think you uncouple and uncouple and uncouple and it probably is dysfunctional. But what you want is a single message about we want ethical behavior, we want to achieve a social purpose, and we want it always uh, to balance with our, our economic objectives. Some things are subject to compliance standards in the law and regulation, but 
but that's a small subset of a much larger, larger concern that our company has for uh, good behavior and for ethical behavior. So um, uh, that would be the way I, I would uh, argue not to uncouple them. We do argue one other thing though about how you manage ethics. Even though we emphasize that the CEO has got to be setting the, the overall ethical tone and be in, in essence, the chief ethics officer. We make a plea that the, the chief ethics officer of companies be given some voice uh, about top strategic decisions uh, to talk about the risks involved in them. This, this decision to go into China and buy companies there was done without the input of the ethics officer who might've said, hey, we got some risk here. Um, and uh, a major uh, healthcare corporation, um, um, one of the leaders of, of the Ethics uh, and Compliance Officers Association, he reflected at the end of his career that as his career went on, occasionally he would be brought into what he called macro ethics decisions rather than just micro ethics decisions. He said, I could work forever on uh, people who cheat on their expense report but I'd like some voice in how we set pricing on our hospital services or whatever. So in, in the last couple of years, he had more opportunities to do that than in his early career years. Great, we're starting to get more questions from the audience. So I just wanna remind people that they can put them in the Q and A if they um, have a question they want Kirk to address. Over to you, Jonathan. Perfect. Um, I'm going to jump to one of my personal favorite questions that I have for you. Uh, Sounds what like a zinger. Sounds like a zinger coming. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, you speak a lot about the importance of ethical business, obviously, and how some businesses, like you mentioned, like Wells Fargo, when they had certain incentive systems were to the hour, mm -hmm. a lot of employees had to work. Uh, are there some companies or overall fields of business that are specifically crisis prone in your eyes? Yeah. And what would that mean to solve those issues where it's more crisis prone than other industries that exist currently? Sure. I, I believe there are certain industries that are more crisis prone, but there are also certain companies that are more crisis prone. Um, these difficult environments, the bad orchard concept, helps us identify particular industries that may have greater ethics risks. And so those are, if you like, crisis prone industries, aircraft um, uh, sales, manufacturing and sales is certainly one of them. Um, some of defense contracting is particularly cutthroat and can be very a very difficult environment. We look traditionally at garbage collection in some cities uh, which had uh, uh, the influence of, of um, uh, organized crime. Uh, that was a particularly crisis prone industry. And for perhaps the last 50 to 60 years since the, um, um, uh, the building of the interstate highways, interstate construction or highway construction, road construction, because it was very large contracts negotiated at the local level with mayors and city councils and, and state governments uh, was often a much more difficult um, uh, area where there was more scandal and more temptation. So those areas and others, uh, those that are uh, uh, internet companies face very difficult choices now without a control content, for example, that's a classic in my mind, case of a crisis prone environment. Um, but then we use the term in the book, crisis prone organizations, because we think companies that don't acknowledge their need to manage bad apples and bad, and their culture, bad barrel, and the orchards uh, are gonna be more crisis prone. And those that haven't done the kind of ethical risk analysis. And we believe that this is of high relevance to investors. Uh, and uh, in the future, those companies that aren't thinking that way are not going to be as good investments. 
We've made that argument for a long time, but it's becoming truer and truer today. Clearly in the climate arena, uh, those companies that don't know what exposure they have to rising sea levels or to potential um, increases in, in global warming uh, are gonna be more vulnerable and more crisis prone. Uh, so the concept of being crisis prepared is really important for the company as well as if you're in a difficult bad orchard. Um, and this is kind of touching upon what you were saying at the end, but this is a question from the audience. And they ask many young companies um, see little need for ethics, just assuming that they're ethical now and they'll continue to be in the future. Mm -hmm. So how can you convince a company that is um, skeptical about like keeping up with ethics, um, how can you convince the company and leadership that ethics is important to them? Well, yeah, there, there are really two questions embedded in that. One is, what do you do about the entrepreneurial company? When should it begin to think about ethics? And the other is, um, uh, how do you convince somebody who just is resistant to the concept? Um, let, let's talk about the, the entrepreneurial company. Uh, in the Valley, we have admired companies that from the beginning had both a social and an economic purpose. And I'll mention two that are my favorites, Hewlett Packard in the old days uh, and Adobe. Uh, we just lost uh, one of the co-founders of Adobe last week, Chuck Geschke. But both of those organizations from their initial creation had a very strong belief in a social and an economic purpose in a strong set of ethical values. We've had other organizations that have not had that and have been run into constant problems, whether it's uh, uh, they're hell bent for growth, no matter what. Uh, they, they believe that it's their personal right to be a billionaire, to have a unicorn, um, but uh, uh, simply don't address the ethical questions until it hits them in the face. Um, some of those, uh, are simply believing that um, it couldn't happen here or we'll never get caught for what we do. But uh, increasingly, the external systems of uh, monitoring and control are good enough to catch most uh, egregious behavior. You've got the other element, which is that employees are now starting to be a major force for good behavior. And seeing the, the employees rise up in the Black Lives Matter case, um, in uh, Me Too era, and demand action on the part of the company is really heartening. And that's changed the game. Um, I, I, I was watching Delta's decision-making around uh, whether to um, uh, object to the new Georgia uh, laws which have suppressed voting. And uh, Delta, has a number of benefits from the Georgia state legislature that it would like not to lose. Uh, and so it was hesitant in my view, initially to come out very strongly on that, but it's employees, it has a substantial employee base of uh, African-American employees and Latinx uh, employees who um, uh, simply were pressuring the company and were outraged by what was occurring in, in Delta's backyard. Coca-Cola also in Georgia uh, has uh, taken on the issue, perhaps a bit reluctantly, but uh, in the end has come out against the, the Georgia laws because of their employee base and their publicly stated uh, commitments. Um, if you've got somebody who resists, I, I think the best case you can make is to point out the costs, the rising costs to companies of misbehavior and uh, hope that that gets across, that we hope that they see that they can't uh, tell their employees that uh, uh, they're simply, excuse me, my dog, my dog is trying to tell me that he wants to go out. <laughs> uh, one second, Juno, down. There we are. This is an ethical dilemma. <laughs> this is an ethical dilemma. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I, I think investors will become more active and that will help make the case for the skeptics. 
but uh, I believe people are happier who work for companies that have a balance of social and economic purposes. I believe that the company will less often encounter misbehavior within the organization. You can't wipe out all misconduct. There are going to be a few bad apples, no matter how good a job you do at screening and training and, and monitoring them. Uh, but you hope that the bad uh, barrels, the corporate environment creates incentives to do the right thing. And you hope that you've put enough risk mitigation things in place uh, to head off uh, the influences of bad orchards. Um, so uh, I believe the case is getting stronger. Uh, I believe that if somebody, uh, if an executive who's skeptical really looked at it hard, they'd come to understand that the long-term success of their company depends upon this kind of active management of uh, the ethics of the corporation and ethics risk. The sad part is we have too many senior executives who are short-term oriented, who want to get their bonus this year or next year and then cash out, um, who believe that as long as they can support the stock price through the next 36 months or the next 60 months, uh, then uh, their wealth is assured. Um, I, I hope that that kind of short-term thinking, self-interested thinking, self-interest alone, uh, does not dominate uh, corporate decision-making uh, in the next uh, uh, era. So uh, I'm, I'm optimistic in the end, uh, but I'm terribly realistic about what's creating this spate of misconduct. Um, I, we, my co-author, Mark Epstein, who I've known, worked with for 50 years, uh, we, uh, uh, we both, in the end, I, we finally looked at each other after writing the first draft of the book and said, does this thoroughly depress you or uh, are we optimistic? And I think we both came out relatively optimistic that uh, there are some prescriptions that we can give and that we have some hope companies will follow. I have uh, very quickly one more um, from myself, a audience question. Mm -hmm. And I, it is, what recommendations do you have for boards of companies to prolong these ethics? Well, they, the, um, one of our 10 recommendations is that the board take a whole different new level of accountability for the ethics of the organization. And so we, we make a series of specific recommendations. Basically, we want the corporation to see that it, the, the board to see that it is responsible for the ethical commitments, the balance of economic and social purpose, the ethical culture, um, and the ethical performance of the organization. And too many boards have either delegated that to an ethics committee or to um, an audit committee and don't consider that to be a fundamental board responsibility. The other thing is that boards have really got to become engaged in the ethics risk process, uh, understanding what's going on in the company currently, what the current ethical performance is. That in that chapter where we talk about ethics risk, we give a, a, an instrument for how you measure past ethical performance and how you predict future ethical risk. They need to be the body to whom that report on ethical performance is addressed. They've got to take responsibility for receiving that annual evaluation of how well we've done. And then they've got to be responsible for saying whether the measures to manage ethical risk are adequate going into the future. Um, too many boards in the past have been disengaged in general or specifically disengaged from the ethics question. Boards uh, over the last five to 10 years have tended to get involved in ethics questions primarily when there's a whistleblower complaint and they have to decide whether to have an external investigation um, uh, or uh, when there is a scandal that somehow they've got to take a stand on. Uh, that's not adequate engagement by the board. So in conjunction to um, the board, how do uh, investors play a role in ethics at companies? Well, the, the, the holy grail of, of 
everyone that I've ever known working in business ethics was that the investors would wake up and realize they had a financial incentive to uh, invest in companies that get ethics right. Uh, I still believe that is generally true, but there are a lot of companies that make a lot of money and aren't very ethically sensitive. Um, and to be honest, it's hard to quantify exactly how much good ethical behavior contributes to the bottom line. In some ways, it's easier to make the case if you get engaged in misconduct, here's the fine you're gonna pay and here's the disruption to your business. If you told Siemens uh, it had a worldwide system of bribery it was engaged in and was finally um, disrupted about 10 years ago. Siemens um, paid immediately billions of dollars of fines and uh, investment in creating ethics and compliance systems. Um, at the time, that was a huge amount of money. Uh, in the book, we review the last two years fines, which are now uh, many fines in excess of a billion dollars for egregious corporate behavior. So um, that's, that's a more concrete case. Uh, the subtle case is your employees will work harder and be more creative uh, and put it more energy in if they believe they're achieving their personal goals of both contributing socially as well as economically. Uh, but, but we believe that's true. Um, I, I write a, a newsletter now called Ethics Megatrends uh, to get that plug in. Uh, and uh, if uh, what I try to point out there is broad trends, which will have an effect on how corporations manage their ethical behavior. And the trend I talked about in the last newsletter was the fact that I think the tipping point has come. Every company is going to be expected to report on their exposure to climate change, what that's going to do to the business model, to the costs of production, uh, to their uh, facilities and locations. Uh, so I think um, uh, that will be part of a broader reckoning that investors will start to think more seriously about this. So Kirk, I think maybe we have time for just maybe, um, I'm hoping we get two more questions in. Okay. Um, one's from our colleague, David Dukas, um, wanting to know um, your take on the current disputes over the sharing of the IP for the, the coronavirus vaccines and um, how companies should be thinking about um, their obligations to their own organization versus their obligations to all of humanity. Now I remember why I always got concerned when David Dukas had a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is, and, right. you and me both. <laughs> David is one of our most thoughtful uh, senior scholars at the uh, Ethics Center. Uh, clearly, companies should get some credit for having developed the coronavirus uh, vaccines. But in many cases, they've been helped by substantial investments of federal money. Uh, government money. And so I think that changes the nature of their obligation. Uh, and that if they've been helped tremendously by uh, uh, subsidies, then they have more of an obligation to think about how to share it. One could make another argument, which is that in an emergency, every company has an obligation to do whatever they can to relieve these hundreds of thousands of deaths that are occurring in the United States or globally now. And so um, uh, I think we can't think about absolute property rights in regard to vaccines. Uh, Joe Biden twisted the arm of Merck when he became president. Merck, you, your, your vaccine did not succeed. It, they had a, a very good a likely vaccine, but in the end it, it didn't get approved but you've got manufacturing capacity. So I want you today to start transforming that manufacturing capacity into making the drugs developed by your competitors. And Merck has done that. And that's part of what I believe is good corporate behavior of saying, what are the, so this is having a social purpose. In the time of, of a pandemic, everybody's social purpose is the alleviation of that pandemic. And so, uh, it's hard to give a, a, a rule uh, in terms of how many countries you ought to cross license that 
uh, uh, vaccine to, but you ought to be open to as much of that granting of uh, uh, access to that intellectual property as possible. And I always thought if I talked long enough, maybe I'd wear David out and he wouldn't uh, follow up. <laughs> so tough question. One more. Yes, last question um, from the audience is, are there any resources that can help consumers identify and support companies that have better ethical practices? There are quite a few organizations which uh, have been created both to measure corporate ethical performance and to help people invest in them uh, and to help people identify them to patronize. Um, I, I don't want to single out any particular source. There are a variety of investment funds uh, that one can consult. If you put clean funds or socially responsible funds or ethical funds into search engines, uh, that would be a way of finding uh, some of those investments. Uh, three organizations I will mention, uh, B Lab, uh, the organization which promotes B Corps, um, uh, public benefit corporations, has quite a few resources on their website talking about companies that do it right and how to do it right. Uh, an organization called Just Capital, which is promoting the idea of investing in uh, responsible and ethical uh, organizations. And a um, uh, new organization uh, called Imperative 21, which is trying to identify specific steps companies and governments can take to try to incent the right kind of behavior to have good orchards, not bad orchards, uh, and so on. So I'll mention those, but there are many more, many of them mentioned in the book. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I hope uh, the book might be a good resource because it does uh, uh, mention a number of resources uh, and suggest criteria for how an employee, for example, prospective employee might choose between a good company and a bad company, a good company and a better company. And of course, we, we have some resources of our own on the Markle Center site. So um, we encourage people to check it out there. Well, we're just a little bit past time. So we're gonna wrap it up here. I wanna thank Isabella and Jonathan for a great job in um, preparing for today and um, interviewing you, Kirk. And I wanna thank you, Kirk, for coming back. A lot of the comments uh, in the Q&A are just from colleagues saying how much they have missed you and how good it is to see you back on campus. And I agree. So, well, thank you thanks very, very much. much. Thank you, Isabella and Jonathan, particularly. Your uh, examples of what we hope to uh, uh, produce uh, to help shape uh, the experiences you have uh, at Santa Clara. And I think it's wonderful to have you as the questioners in this. And I'm delighted that Anne continues to, to develop and manage this area. So thank you for the opportunity. And it was a pleasure being able to interview you and also really enjoyed the book. So I encourage everyone listening um, to go out and read it. It's a great read. I'll yes, thank you, you so much the, for your time. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you your reward for that comment. Afterwards. <laughs> all right. Thanks, you all. See you later. <laughs>